All right, uh, thank you so much for your patience. I, I've had a very busy uh, day today. Um, I was just uh, uh, at another bar. Um, so my name is Preston So. Welcome. I'm from Slack Day. No, no, Preston Day. And it's my pleasure to be here at Triple Common Bike uh, with all of you. And um, uh, how's the conference so far? Great. 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 Okay, great. Um, as long as it's you know, going well, uh, I, I'm very excited to be here because I think um, it's, it's just a very, very cool space um, and a very cool city, a very cool country. Um, and I told many people actually on this trip so far, I would love to live uh, in Mumbai or Pune or even anywhere in India in general. Um, so thank you so much for being such wonderful, wonderful hosts. Um, so uh, here's a little bit of information uh, about me. Uh, I am uh, an Aquian, and uh, I've been working with this since 2007. Um, and uh, I'm also very much involved in the community. So here's what we're going to talk about. Um, the first thing is I want to delve a little bit into what is decoupled Drupal. Uh, how many people have heard of decoupled Drupal? Okay, great, so we've got a lot of people that have been exposed to both. Um, and then I want to dig into sort of a little bit more about React uh, architecture and how you build components with React, um, and then talk a little bit about React and decoupled Drupal, and then also talk about how Drupal might fit into the larger Drupal ecosystem, um, as well as some sort of common areas of uh, uh, sort of uh, work that can happen uh, within Drupal. So I was just finishing up these slides now. Uh, Code highlighting might be a bit of an issue. Um, there might be some problems with the slides. Uh, I apologize, but at the end of the conference, I will have a much better set of slides for you, given that I just finished this in the last two minutes. Um, and I'm going to talk about React uh, from a bit more of a surface level. I, uh, I know that a lot of people have probably heard of Flux as well, uh, which is a, an, a, an architectural approach to building uh, React applications. I'm not going to dig into Flux because it's a bit out of scope of this particular talk. Um, but I do think that it's worth exploration, and possibly in the next talk I give about this, I will uh, I delve into that a little bit. So first of all, what is decoupled Drupal exactly? Um, so as a bit of history, uh, Drupal is a content management system that many people consider to be quite monolithic, let's say. It's a traditional CMS in the sense that the CMS provides a soup to nuts feature set. This means that anything that you need to do as a site builder or a themer or a developer is all wrapped up somehow in Drupal. And Drupal serves as a framework uh, uh, which gives you the tools to, to, to do a whole lot of things. This includes things like server-side templating, um, and all the markup eventually through a bunch of concatenation is uh, uh, served to the client um, as a server-side render, basically. So uh, there's a big um, you know, shift happening in the web these days. Uh, which is that originally, you know, if you started working with web design way back in the early 90s or, or, or mid 90s, um, honestly, chances are you were probably working with flat fronted assets, HTML, JavaScript, CSS. You would upload them via FTP, you would go to your browser, type in the URL, and that was it. Uh, for a lot of people, this was very easy, and the job position of webmaster was very popular back in those days. With Web 2.0, what really changed is that we had an introduction of a, of, of a mediator or a CMS which would provide a template engine through which data would travel. And then this template engine would produce a rendered markup, uh, a, a form of rendered markup. And the server side would actually provide all the data. You wouldn't actually have uh, anything happening on the client side. This is back in the days when JavaScript was not uh, uh, not the most well supported language in many browsers. Actually, this was when Netscape and Internet Explorer actually had different approaches to a lot of the methods you find uh, in the JavaScript API. So um, as a result, uh, it, you know, things were pretty real. And uh, you know, what, in, what was introduced during this time period uh, was a topic called AJAX, originally known as asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Uh, basically, you would use uh, XML HTTP requests to uh, make calls to your, make asynchronous calls to your server and retrieve data um, that you could then use to uh, replace a single DOM node or so on and so forth. Now, in this Web 3.0 world, where we're talking a lot more about multi-channel publishing, we're talking a lot more about uh, native mobile applications, single page applications built with JavaScript, and of course, nowadays, Internet of Things applications, um, nowadays, we're using a RESTful API as the mediator between the server and the client. What this means is that you make RESTful calls to your, to your REST API using HTTP methods, um, and uh, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, actually uh, all the time, this would be done asynchronously. So, you would have a REST call getting sent out from your client-side application, and, it would, and the server would respond with a payload that could be JSON or XML or 
what have you, which you would then parse into uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, manipulate, manipulate your DOM uh, to actually provide that new data dynamically on the client side. So what is decoupled Drupal as a concept? Well, you know, a lot of people call it headless Drupal, um, and uh, uh, you know, there's a bit of a controversy about that because in uh, Wikipedia defines headless software as software that does not require a GUI. And a great example of this is like Drush or the Drupal console, right? Um, so I prefer the term decoupled Drupal because it's it's much clearer that you know there's not just one single head that you're decoupling. It could be a variety of different front ends. Um, against a single backend. So this is a very important thing to keep in mind is that you know, terminology, of course, uh, one of the two big problems in computer science is naming things, right? Uh, and then trash value. Naming things, we have to be very careful with our, with our names to make sure that people don't get confused. So simply put, decoupled Drupal is the use of a RESTful API as a Drupal data provider. Now, uh, there's sort of two emerging types of architectures that are coming out of the wild that use this kind of architecture, uh, that, that use this approach. Um, and the first is what uh, Dries calls uh, fully decoupled Drupal, which is Drupal serves solely as a JSON API that serves JSON payloads, payloads um, to applications like uh, your JavaScript applications, your uh, mobile applications, and oftentimes you'll have a client-side framework, an MD star framework, a model view star uh, framework take over, or sorry, uh, handles handle all the rendering. And so this is often done isomorphically in which the, uh, you have a Node.js server which uh, does a server-side render of uh, which executes your framework on the server side to give that initial render, and then uh, that gets served to the client in order to you know, provide a very quick time to first interaction, you know, no blank screen, and things like SEO. Uh, so that uh, happens uh, in a fully decoupled setting. Now, uh, recently, uh, Dries published a very important blog post uh, called The Future of Decoupled Drupal, which I highly encourage all of you to read, uh, about the fact that you know, fully decoupled Drupal has a lot of problems. So there's this new paradigm that he's proposed, which is actually, you, you, you know, there are some cases of this in the wild, uh, namely weather.com, uh, which uses an Angular, which uses Drupal to render pages, but then Angular uh, actually takes over for the client-side rendering. So in progressive decoupling, Drupal controls some of the render to provide initial page structure or markup or important render information that you might need as, uh, as a JavaScript uh, as a JavaScript developer. And then uh, JavaScript then takes over the further rendering that is uh, required on the client side. So what are some problems of decoupled Drupal? Well, one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, when you fully decouple, namely when you use J uh, Drupal solely as a RESTful data provider, uh, you have a, a lot of issues. Oh. Hello, hello. Is that good? Hello? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. Uh, can everybody hear me now? Yeah, yes. OK, OK, take care. Uh, so, uh, so much of Drupal's robustness is lost, uh, namely things like cross-origin requests, security. Uh, a lot of these frameworks have not really necessarily solved uh, some core issues of security. There's a lot of uh, uh, you know, discussion happening in the Node.js community about these issues. Um, authentication and passwords, obviously, are, are, are two very important topics for us as Drupal developers. Um, things like form validation, right? Drupal solves that for us. Uh, if you use Drupal monolithically, it, 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 you know, all of that sort of stuff is solved using our form API. You don't really need to worry too much about uh, form validation. Uh, and then for users of Drupal, namely site builders, content marketers, content editors, things like content workflow and management, right? So how do you use something like work, uh, Workbench uh, with a uh, client-side application? How do you, how do you really uh, you know, work with these things that people are very used to? Um, and and you know allow that to sort of filter into the client side application. Uh, things like layout and display management, um, you know things like display suite, uh, panels. Um, those things are sort of you know not really usable. And oftentimes, if you have a front end application, uh, you have um, you know the need to actually change the layout. Uh, you're going to have to get a Josh developer involved and call up your 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 genius on the other line and say, hey, I, I really need you to, to change this for me, but I have no idea how this works. Um, also, multilingual and localization. So Drupal, uh, how many of you were at the multilingual session yesterday? Like that one. Really awesome stuff. Um, the thing is that uh, you know, each client-side framework tends to have its own approach to multilingual. For example, Angular has a totally different approach to multilingual. Um, and so the, the big problem is how do we actually bridge that gap, right? Because Drupal also has its own client-side way of doing multilingual. Um, Thank you. All right, so, uh, and then the last thing is, um, <laughs> the last thing is accessibility and user experience. Um, so, uh, you know, I like to call this sort of the beginning of the, the sort of new wild west of markup. In the early 2000s, we had the big, you know, the, the giant web standards movement led by people like Jeffrey Zeldman who said, we need to really fix markup. 
And um, you know, if you've been, if you've ever heard Morton DK's talks about the angry beamer and how markup is this huge issue that Drupal has, um, you know, one of the things that, that that is very important is we need to keep our markup as robust as possible, valid, uh, semantic markup. And the problem is that when you're using a client-side application, if, if you're if you're developing a client-side application with a client-side framework, then you are pretty much on your own when it comes to figuring out things like accessibility, uh, UX. I'm really worried about the future of, of those sorts of things. Um, so now that we've talked about what these things are, how do you actually work with uh, these things, right? Um, so in Drupal 7, uh, uh, Drupal 7 has no opinionated REST um, layer <coughs> out of the box. Namely, when you install Drupal 7, there's no way to actually use it as a, as a REST API. Um, so there's the services module, which uh, is, is uh, a very, very popular solution for Drupal 7. I highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, it has built-in REST and XML RPC interfaces. Um, it, it exposes content entities um, at endpoints that you can sort of uh, delineate. Um, and then there's also the services any module, uh, which extends it to include all any types. There's also RESTWS and RESTful. Um, RESTWS is uh, able to expose, you know, you can use the same path uh, uh, based on headers, and basically the, the headers will, will help you differentiate uh, uh, what pay, what, what's, what's returned, what, what the response is. Uh, RESTful uh, will uh, expose entities, and you can actually begin to cater some of that data to the specific needs of your front end. Now, what about uh, Drupal 8? Ah, uh, there's an empty bullet there. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, was very important in Drupal 8 was whiskey. Um, and it's not, I'm not talking about alcohol, I'm talking about the web services and context core initiative, uh, which was led by Larry Garfield, aka Krell, uh, which incorporated web services as a, as a, as a, as a concept in the Drupal 8 core. Um, so the core REST modules that are in place in Drupal 8 now allow for all content entities to be exposed, namely users, taxonomies, uh, comments, uh, what have you. Um, and also, if you go into views, there's actually a new display type called REST export that you can use um, uh, to basically get uh, a really nice uh, uh, view <laughs> of your uh, of your actual uh, uh, of your query. Now, um, there are many issues with REST and core. Um, I, I don't know how many of you may have seen Wynn Lewis's uh, blog post recently about about REST. And actually, the last blog I was just in was talking about uh, the REST experience. Um, which is, you know, how uh, do you know how does it feel using our REST API, using our REST, uh, our REST API core, um, and, and and what are some ways that we can fix that? So I highly encourage you to, to look at RX or REST experience package issues in Drupal.org, um, and and begin to think about it because uh, ultimately uh, those sorts of things will impact hugely the uh, market that Drupal has. Uh, there's also one other module that I want to want to mention, uh, which is Relaxed. Um, so Relax is a contributed module which uh, extends the core REST API to include revisions, file attachments, and also one of the one of the big uh, issues of um, of the core REST API is that there's there's no way to distinguish between uh, you know basically it's very it's, it's 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 very hard to provide unique identifiers that can be shared across environments. So if you deploy content um, and you and you need to preserve that commonality, it's it's very hard to do that without Relax. Um, and Relax is also very important from the, from the standpoint of content staging and offline first applications, and it explicitly uses the uh, CouchDB API stack. <laughs> so uh, how do you go about setting up RESTful Drupal? Well, um, the way that I would recommend going about doing it is to download Aquia that desktop. If you go to aquia.com slash downloads, uh, there's, uh, this is a, uh, basically um, uh, an, um, uh, a stack that you can use to uh, basically develop Drupal locally. Uh, it's the most painless way to set up the Drupal site. You can just download the DA distribution and get running. Um, and so just make sure that's working locally. You want to check that that you're, um, that's all set up. Um, and then also Drush is the fastest way to sort of quickly download and install any dependencies that you might have. So uh, now that you have a working Drupal site, uh, Core actually does not allow you, uh, does not enable these modules by default. So you'll want to go in and enable how basic auth, serialization, and REST. Um, and now, if you want to configure to configure the the the, um, the core REST, you can either download the REST UI module, which is uh, actually a very useful tool um, if you're more of a visual person, or you can also edit the YAML file uh, to configure uh, what's uh, what's available. Let me actually just show that to you really quickly. Um, so over here, uh, let's see. So this is a, a site that I've already set up, which has um, quite a few things. Oh, sorry, this is cut off a little bit. But, okay. So if we go down here, uh, REST UI, um, this gives you a very nice view of, of how to actually 
uh, of, of all of your methods over here. Um, and basically allows you to go in, you can edit, and basically set permissions for all of these. Um, I generally, uh, for, for just development purposes, check all of these. Uh, obviously, you don't want to do that all the time for security purposes. Um, but that should give you an idea. And if you go to the, um, actually, if you go back to the extent page, um, you can see that uh, we have our REST modules down here, the web services modules here. So um, <coughs> there we go. Uh, and then the next thing I would recommend doing is, is if you want to get started really quickly, uh, is to just do uh, develop generate, which allows you to just generate some content really quickly so you can have a sandbox to begin working. Um, so just enable develop and then gen C, which is generate some content, it'll take some filler text and you can create 20 nodes or however many uh, you need to get started. Uh, okay, that was ah, interesting. Okay, um, so uh, then I would also highly recommend using uh, a tool called Postman, um, which is a very uh, easy to use testing uh, tool, REST client to complete test the REST API. Uh, make sure your data is you know, provisioned correctly. Uh, you can get it as a Chrome extension or a desktop application. Um, so for example, this right here is fetching a, uh, a single node of NID1. Um, and I'll actually show you very quickly what that looks like. Um, let's see, here we go. Uh, so here's Postman. Um, and as you can see, I've got my site set up here. And um, actually, so um, normally we want to have some kind of an authentication header. And I'll show you, uh, a, you know, briefly what that looks like later. Um, but for now, because I've set permissions so that any anonymous user can just go in and, and, and perform get requests uh, across our nodes, if I go ahead and uh, perform this request, you can see that I get a JSON payload back, uh, which has all of the sort of basic information that I need um, from the node. Great. Any questions so far, by the way? OK. Um, now, the next thing is, okay, where is, here we go. Um, the next thing that we, want, that, that we might want to do is to perform a post, and this will actually allow us to create a new node. So let me actually go back to here, and I'll show you very briefly what uh, my current content looks like. If I go to the content view, you'll see that I've got some nodes here, and um, you know, there's, there's, there's not really, uh, you know, this, is, this is stuff you've all seen before. Um, now, if I go to uh, Postman, and I go to this uh, you know, pre-created uh, request that I have, and as you can see, I'm using basic auth as a way to authenticate into Drupal. I'll update the request, and then if I look at the headers, you'll see that now I've got my, auth, my uh, token here. And if I send the request, oh, I'm sorry, I need to put in some information here. So uh, let me just go back here. This is really not the most fun right now. <laughs> but if I go in and I create and I go do this, paste that in there. Come on. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Uh, and then I, you know, here's the, here's the, here's the type that I'm going to do. Uh, let me make the title DrupalCon by and no special stuff. Okay, so now if I go over to, and I, and I send this request, I get a 201 created uh, status code. And if I go back, what you'll notice is, I now have a new node, Drupal Common By, uh, which says no start this one, right? Great, so um, now we know that we can do things uh, with uh, uh, just, you know, basically doing CRUD on nodes uh, with Drupal. If you want to read more about this, there's a whole lot of uh, information on Drupal.org about this, and I'm going to sort of stop the demo here and move on. Um, so uh, if you want to update a node, for example, by uh, through through the REST API, you can do that very easily as well. Okay, so that's a very quick introduction to the basics of um, how to set up decoupled Drupal. Um, and I think that, you know, what's very, what's very important uh, at this point is that I'm just using the core REST API as it exists right now on all content entities. Normally, uh, you know, a lot of times your API needs will be a lot more extensive than what core REST provides. Um, and it's a very good idea philosophically to, uh, uh, to design your API spec before you actually begin writing your client-side application. Because, you know, you, you don't really know who's going to use the API. You want to make sure that that's as robust as possible before it. Um, so with that in mind, that's why I wanted to introduce decoupled Drupal and sort of the way you set up RESTful Drupal before digging into React. So uh, with that in mind, um, now let me go ahead and dig a little bit into React. 
And once again, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's going to move pretty quick. Um, but I think that overall, uh, I want to give you a big picture of what's going on. And at some point very soon, I'll have a GitHub repo which you can access, which has all of this stuff uh, already built in. So what is React? Well, I think it might help to start by talking about the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, history of React. Uh, React was started in 2013. If you think about the progression of various client-side frameworks and how they've evolved, uh, React is sort of the baby. Um, it's really quickly grown in popularity because of its uh, you know, declarative approach to state, um, its co-location of templates with uh, view logic, and its really sort of unopinionatedness, unopinionatedness, ooh, hard work, unopinionatedness about the stack. What that means is that React doesn't really care a whole lot about what you're using in terms of your model and controller, or if you're using a flux architecture, what you're doing for your uh, dispatcher and, and your and your interaction. So, um, in the last few years, a much larger ecosystem has grown around React, and I'll talk a bit about that towards the end. So, uh, Facebook literally calls React a library for building composable user interfaces with reusable components. Um, so these components can be nested, they, they can have arbitrary hierarchies, um, and many people uh, choose to think of React as the V in MVC. Um, MVC being the model view controller paradigm. Um, and you know, there are a lot of people who argue that that's not the, the, that not, not the best description, but I think it's very useful from the standpoint of just getting, you know, getting your feedback with Drupal. So because React is a library, there are a lot of starter kits that you can use. Um, if you just Google React starter kit, there's like a million results that come up. There's not really a canonically uh, sort of standardized set of libraries to use. Um, you sort of have to pick and choose and investigate uh, based on your preferences and, 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 and your sort of needs. In this presentation, I'm really only going to talk about React because if I talk about uh, starter kits or if I delve into a whole lot more, it's going to get really messy. So, what are some differences uh, of React from other frameworks? It's uh, oftentimes people will say it's not really useful to compare uh, React to MVC frameworks or these larger scale frameworks. Um, but I actually think that the, that the place where there's a lot of uh, uh, overlap in terms of how we can compare them is, doc is, is manipulation of the DOM. So uh, traditionally, uh, you know, up until about, uh, I would say about two years, or about a year ago, um, the, these sort of traditional MVC frameworks that we know very well, like Backward and Angular, uh, you know, they use the declarative approach and two-way data binding, um, but they also need to apply changes directly on the DOM. And so if you've ever used Angular 1, uh, how many people have ever seen like dollar scope in Angular 1 and messed around with that and been and torn your hair out, right? This is like one of the big problems with, uh, with Angular 1 is that actually if you look at Angular, it's, it's, it was originally designed to be a prototyping framework. Um, and so when you need to manipulate a whole lot of DOM nodes, it's really, it really is a big drag on performance. React uses what's called a virtual DOM, which uh, uh, I refer to as an abstract DOM because there's a whole lot of other uh, solutions out there for the same kind of thing, uh, namely incremental DOM, which is a Google project. Um, and it's an abstract DOM which allows different states in your UI to be diffed against each other. Uh, and so what happens is using this diff, React basically takes that diff and figures out the most efficient way to manipulate the DOM uh, uh, to, to uh, basically keep your performance really high. Um, I'm not going to dig into virtual DOM. There's a whole lot of resources if you want to learn more about it. Now, what are some drawbacks of React? Well, um, you know, it, this, this won't be a fair presentation unless I talk a little bit about the disadvantages and why you might want to re reconsider using React uh, if I've been you know, convincing you already. React is, there's, there's, there's not a uh, 1.x release yet of React, uh, which means that uh, it's still very unstable. There's a lot of changes that are happening. It's not, uh, you know, the most uh, easy thing to uh, follow in terms of upgrade, pa upgrade paths. Um, and so there's a lot, there's, there, you know, there are quite a few backwards compatibility breaking changes in React. Uh, React builds are challenging also because, excuse me, because there's not a, you know, there's not full coverage of the stack, right? What that means is that um, as opposed to, let's say, um, Angular, uh, or or um, or Ember in particular, um, you really need to figure out your own way to do certain things with with React. So um, flux architectures, uh, a lot of people have been talking about those, uh, and there's also the the, the Redux framework, which is um, basically a very popular approach to flux architectures that I highly encourage you to check out as well. Also, uh, one thing to note is that React has a bit less focus on web component support. Um, Angular 2 uh, uh, will uh, uh, be able to integrate, I believe, with uh, Polymer. Um, and Ember actually has an explicit roadmap for once web components becomes a W3C recommendation, um, there will be support for web components in Ember. Okay, 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to set up React. Um, and I'm going to move through this pretty quickly, but I do want to note that, once again, I want to talk about this from a very high level. I've uh, taken a lot of these examples from a very uh, influential 24 Ways article called Universal React uh, by, Jack, by Jack Franklin, which is actually a very, very good resource in terms of learning about isomorphic approaches to JavaScript, namely JavaScript across the stack. So if you want to start from scratch, basically what you want to do is just utilize a node project um, and basically use the, the um, install uh, uh, install argument to provide um, certain libraries that you need to use. So for example, um, the save flag will save it into your package.json file as a dependency that you need for, for production or for builds. Not for development, right? So things like developer tools like Gulp or Grunt, those are not considered dependencies with the save flag. For the for development dependencies, you want to use uh, save them. So, um, next thing is that we're, uh, I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit about um, uh, ES6 or ES2015, ECMA script 2015 here, um, because I think it's very useful to, to, uh, to, to sort of introduce some of these concepts of uh, ES6 um, in this context as well. In order to do that, we need Babel. And uh, Babel you know, has gotten a lot of flack lately because um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite um, uh, has some problems sometimes. <laughs> um, so uh, in your Babel, you know, .babelrc um, uh, configuration file, you want to make sure that you have your ES2015 uh, uh, setting and your React setting so that JSX, which is the template language that uh, React uses, and also ES6 uh, can be transpiled into JavaScript that can run in the browser. Um, we're also going to use an Express server to actually uh, get this going. Um, and uh, the reason why is because we want to provide some server-side rendering. Um, namely, we want to provide that initial state and not have a blank page uh, when you start looking at um, uh, uh, your application. Uh, and then we'll also want to use React Router, which is a very popular solution for uh, uh, routing and connect. So at the end of all of this, your uh, package.json file should look something like this under dependencies and dev dependencies. Um, now, in terms of uh, setting up Express, uh, you want to set up a server.js file which will basically uh, you know, house Express. And what's happening here is, if you notice, uh, these import statements are, are basically calling other modules um, you know, elsewhere uh, uh, to um, actually uh, inject those dependencies. Right? Um, so what's happening here is, if you notice um, actually down in right here, um, this is what's called an arrow function. And if you're familiar with anonymous functions in Drupal, or not Drupal, Anonymous functions in JavaScript, sorry, yeah, it's been a long day. Uh, anonymous functions in JavaScript, then arrow functions are basically, you know, imagine it's just function and then rec and res as your uh, arguments that you're, that you're using for that function. What this is doing, basically, is it's saying, let's set up an express server, let's execute it. Um, let's uh, basically create, let's, let's use our uh, EJS as our view engine, and I'll show you briefly how that, how that looks in terms of uh, setting that up. And then on every single um, uh, uh, get uh, request, basically the wildcard asterisk says any any route, right? Uh, we want to render index, okay? And then uh, we have our at the, at the very end we have our server, and it, you know basically we can you know get the console log out, and it's, it, it shows that we're that, that we're good, right? Um, so the uh, okay, this got a little messed up. Okay, so this is, um, in order for Express to recognize our HTML though, we need to actually save it as um, use slash index.ejs. Uh, this is just an EJS uh, paradigm. And what this should be, um, I'm sorry that this is, this is messed up, but it should be an HTML file, uh, you know, just stop type HTML, HTML, um, uh, uh, head title, and then of course your, your, your body. And if you've gotten this far, you should be able to set this up, and you'll and, and you will see your Express server actually serving this HTML. Uh, so the next thing is uh, that we can start the server locally by executing server.js with Babel node, um, and then uh, uh, if you, and, and, you know if you have it installed globally, if you're using the the G flag, then you can actually just just uh, uh, use Babel node. Okay. Um, I am very sorry that these examples are so messed up. Um, basically, what's happening here is we're going to put in this uh, thing right here, this markup uh, uh, variable, which will allow us to basically replace um, markup with other markup, 
right? So what's going on here is that we're providing a shell for our application to lie in. Um, we have our head and title, which is where this hello world title is. And then we have our body, and within the body we have div ID app, um, and then the markup, which will eventually be replaced. So anything that's inside this app div is going to be our application. So uh, the next thing that we want to do is to do some routing. And uh, this is very important from the context, you know, from the concept that we want to have multiple uh, paths in our application. We don't just, you know, we don't just want to have a home page and, and that's it. Um, so uh, uh, you know, the way this works is that we're going to export an object that contains our routes um, and set up uh, of, you know, basically a hierarchy of uh, routes. Um, basically, the slash route and the slash nodes route are pointing to the index component and nodes component, respectively, in this example. Um, and they're child routes of the overarching uh, uh, path, right? Of the overarching route. Then, in our server.js file, uh, underneath those import statements, we want to import React to provide server side uh, rendering, uh, server side execution of React. We want to do render to string, which is a feature in uh, React DOM, which allows us to basically concatenate all of our stuff together and serve a single, uh, a single um, uh, a string of HTML markup to the client. And then React Router, we want to include some of those dependencies. And finally, we want to include our routes, which we exported, if you remember, from routes.js. Now, uh, here's our first component. Um, so React uh, operates with components, right? Now, if you're familiar with React, uh, you might have seen this before, uh, except that you might have seen something like react.createClass. Um, we're using uh, object-oriented JavaScript here. Of course, object-oriented JavaScript is, is a bit of a misnomer because this prototypical inheritance and also object-orientation in JavaScript now. Um, that's a debate for a whole other session. Um, but right here, what's going on is we're giving um, a, uh, we're setting up a React component called app, com app component, which is our overarching component, which will house all of our child components. And uh, upon render, we're going to give, and this right here, if you're seeing this HTML within the, um, uh, within the return statement, this is actually called JSX, which is the template engine that um, React uses. So what React will do is it'll actually interpret all of this uh, put it into uh, a, a series of JavaScript uh, objects, and then that will be what um, what is actually executing uh, um, in uh, in the browser or you know uh, on your server. So uh, this dot props dot children refers to the child components which are accessible um, from this component. So basically, any any other component that we're building is going to live inside this app component. So let's. So the first uh, other component that we're going to build then is uh, index component. Now, once again, if I go back, you can see that this dot props dot children is going to be where. Excuse me. It's going to be where that index component uh, resides eventually. So you can see how the how the nestable uh, reusable components uh, concept kind of works now. Um, and in this case, we're just going to return a very easy uh, 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 string with a loop again, which is welcome to the home page. And then we also have another component, uh, which also lies inside um, the app component, which is going to be our nodes component. And I'm calling it nodes component because eventually we're going to fetch, you know, fetch a node or fetch some nodes. It's sort of up to you um, and uh, provide uh, uh, some sort of information to React. So um, we want to make sure that when we do server-side rendering, that our server, when we set it up, when, when, when Express actually executes, we want to recognize all of these components as well, because eventually we want these components to be executed uh, uh, and, and visible on, uh, from, from uh, on the client side immediately, um, as if it was a quick page load. And we don't want you know, things to be rendering uh, while the page is loading. So um, what we're doing here is after our routes, we're going to include our components and make sure that, uh, that those are present as well. Now, um, further down, we uh, this is a, a, a um, some request handling that um, is also taken from that that twenty four ways article by Jack Franklin. Um, what's going on here is that um, we're providing a, a basically you know various uh, um, uh, handlers, right? So if you have a response code of of, of five hundred, or you know, or you have a redirect, um, or if you have props, which means that um, you are actually have you actually have a valid component to render. Um, then you'll uh, invoke render to string, um, and this, I'm sorry, this should actually be routing uh, context in, uh, um, uh, with routing and context capitalized. Um, but then basically what will happen is you will, uh, you will um, this will render all of the routes on the server side. Does that make sense? Render, this will render all the routes on the server side, so we have all of our components also 
rendered on the server side. Um, and then uh, we're going to send that. If you, re if you recall, uh, the original uh, app.get um, uh, uh, function that we had, uh, this, this function that we had, um, was just rendering to the index view. But if you look here, we're providing this additional argument, which is Martha. And if you think way back to index.ejs with the uh, uh, you know, angle bracket percent, that is where that markup all goes. And then of course, if there's nothing at all, then you want to have a 404. And chances are, uh, you, want, you might want to have a unique view for 404 that you write uh, yourself. Okay, so the other thing that's really compelling about React Router is uh, the concept of uh, linking. So you can actually, um, we can provide a, uh, um, a, uh, a navigation bar within our application to navigate between these routes. Um, and once again, these uh, should be capitalized as link. I will fix these slides and put up a much better version of them uh, after this uh, session. Um, and so uh, what's happening here is that if you think about what app component will look like, right? Imagine that you have a, you know, a massive uh, app component, and then you have your navigation bar, which is you know, a part of the app component. And then further down, you're going to have your uh, uh, other components. Namely, it could be index component based on the index route, or it could be nodes component based on the nodes route. OK, so uh, then the next thing we, we want to do, and once again, this HTML is really messed up. The next thing we want to do is to uh, provide some client-side rendering, right? Because not only do we want server-side rendering in the sense of having our initial state already rendered on the server, uh, we also want to allow further re-rendering to take place on the client side, right? So we want to allow these components to sort of dynamically change based on new data that comes in, um, and so on and so forth. So what we need to do is we need to make this happen on the client side as well. So you want to create a um, client.js or client render, you can name this whatever you want because eventually we're going to actually put this into, pipe this into uh, Webpack. So uh, you want to import React and React DOM, uh, the router for client side routing, um, and, also, and also our routes as well. So we're going to have uh, basically isomorphic routes on both the server and the client. Uh, and then also you want to use create browser history, which is uh, you know, part of the HTML5 history API, which will allow things like back button functionality. Um, and and uh, things like that, and also our clients, our, our routing uh, also provides a means of doing things like bookmarkability. And then you want to render this, right? Um, and you want to do this, uh, and you want to apply this to the app, uh, the app ID div, which um, uh, you saw earlier. Now, uh, what's most important is to build our bundle to productionify our JavaScript so that uh, we only serve a single JavaScript file, um, because you know we want to aggregate, aggregate, aggregate and minify all of our JavaScript. So let's use Webpack for that. Webpack is currently one of the more popular solutions. You can also use Browserify if you so choose. Um, and this is the, the config file on how it looks for uh, Webpack. What we're doing is um, we're going to provide a client.js um, uh, file uh, as the input, which will basically make Webpack take all of those import statements and basically put in all of the dependencies that we need. So uh, what will happen is at the end of this, we'll generate File, which will be which will be used by the browser to actually uh, uh, execute all this JavaScript on the client side as well. So now this is a very key point. You know, now what we've got is we've got our server side stuff all all rendering, all working great, and that is going to serve an initial state uh, of our React application to the client side, um, which is just flat markup. Uh, that's very important to keep in mind. It's just flat markup, right? Then what's happening is we're gonna we're gonna execute um, this bundle.js on the client side, and this will basically take over. Uh, from there and infuse the markup with the interactivity that we all know and love, right? Um, there's, a bit, there's, a, there's a very big concept in client-side framework uh, technologies called rehydration. Uh, you'll probably hear this more in the Ember or Angular context, in which um, after you've provided that initial server-side provided markup, uh, rehydration involves, let's fetch some the new updated data and then update that initial state of the application, um, you know, if that has updated data with this new data. So you've always got a new state of your application regardless of uh, what's happening. And then we want to execute Webpack, uh, and that will create all of the rest. Woo, okay. So, um, now with that in mind, uh, how do we set up React to work with the couple of people, right? Because that's really what uh, you all came to the session to hear about. Um, so the first thing that you want to do is that um, you want to allow your React application to have access to Drupal backend. Drupal, if, you're, if your React application is hosted on, on a different domain, which is what it's going to be most likely, um, you, you, you need to allow uh, uh, that request to happen to Drupal. 
and Drupal will not just allow requests from any domain for security reasons. So um, there's a variety of ways to do this. You can do this in Apache 2. There's, uh, you know, there's ways to do it in Nginx. Um, there's a variety of ways to do it, and it's beyond the scope of the session, uh, but this is just one example. And, and um, you know, obviously there's a lot of security concerns which are way above my pay my, my, my rate um, in terms of uh, thinking about uh, cross-origin requests. Um, and now with uh, REST and React, in order to make calls, make REST calls to our Drupal REST API, I actually recommend using SuperAgent, which is um, something that WordPress Calypso also uses to uh, make API calls to, uh, uh, to the WordPress API. Um, it's a, it has a very lightweight API, and it's actually, you know, it's, it's very comparable to jQuery Ajax. But if you don't want to use jQuery as a dependency, which we are not uh, in this case, um, then uh, you can use SuperAgent as, as a much more lightweight solution. So let's, think, let's, let, let's, let's rewind. So about a, like half an hour ago, which seems like 30 years ago, um, we made a GET request to node slash one with the query param format equals JSON to actually get um, our JSON payload back, right? Now let's make this happen with the super agent, right? So there's a couple of important considerations here. The first is, <coughs> You want to, you, you know, if you're integrating with Drupal and you, and, you, and you have Drupal, right, and you're using uh, React universally, namely isomorphically, um, across the stack, fully coupled, any requests that you make during a server side are going to be synchronous, right? So during the execution of React, during the execution of that server side JavaScript, you're going to make API calls to Drupal. And there's a very sort of, you know, there's a lot of use cases where this makes sense, right? Imagine that you have a, uh, a, a cricket website, right? And, you're, and you've, got some you've, you've, you've got some stats that have you know, the scores of all of the recent matches, right? That is going to probably be served through something like MongoDB, because it's very granular data. Drupal is not the best at handling this, this really granular, you know, sort of small scale data. But then you might have you know, some uh, articles that are served through Drupal about like Sachin Tendulkar or something like that, right? You might have these, you know, this content that needs to be sent out from Drupal uh, that you want to have in your application. So it could be that you're using MongoDB with, uh, with your, with your Node.js stack, and you're also wanting to make these REST API calls on the server side to Drupal to fetch this content so that they live side by side uh, in your React application. Now, to make synchronous requests in a, uh, during a server side render, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, the, the most common way to do this is to make a request um, prior to the invocation of render to string, right? So you want to make this request before the actual string concatenation happens. Um, and that makes it part of React's render markup. Uh, this is tough because the way that uh, components work uh, in conjunction with render to string is a bit uh, brittle in that, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's, you know, it's, it's not very clear where in the process you can actually make this happen. So um, to make this really easy and to, and to make this very sort of uh, uh, clear, what I've, what I've done is to use this approach um, uh, in the React API component did not, which is uh, uh, you know, oftentimes used for both synchronous, namely on the server side, React on the server side, and asynchronous requests, namely on the client side when you execute React. Um, and you can dynamically insert data using the virtual bomb with this approach. So if we go all the way back to our nodes component, Right, and we remember this is what it looked like originally. Right, we had our this is the nodes page, this is flat HTML, and we have our render our uh, render function. Right, we want to add some additional functions here because uh, this will allow us to use React state machine. So if you look here, uh, what what, uh, what we've done here is we're, we're uh, we've um, added an, an, an one additional import statement, which is uh, super agent. We've uh, we've provided a get initial state which is going to be the uh, sort of initial blank state of our component, right? This is traditionally how uh, we define the sort of base default state of each of our components. And if you look, we have our title of body, and you know, that's it. Now, uh, this is, this is kind of pseudocode. I didn't test this. Um, and I, you know, I will provide a code base that, that, that you know. So this may change. Uh, please don't copy paste this or, or use this right now. Um, but what's going on here is what we're going to do is in this component did mount indication, we're going to uh, 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 get super agent and use super agent uh, methods to actually get um, our JSON payload. So what we're doing here is we're, we're, um, we're, we're doing a get request against that path in Drupal. We're setting a header, which is a set application JSON. And in this case, we're not doing any authentication because if you recall, uh, we opened up the permissions to all anonymous users to perform that get request against the method. <coughs> 
Um, then we're going to basically provide a, um, a, a, a um, oh, sorry, this is actually wrong. Wow, this, is, uh, this should actually say note here. Um, but anyway, so what's going on is we're actually setting the state by providing, uh, by traversing that JSON payload and getting the title embodied from the node. This should make sense conceptually, even if uh, this code is not correct. I think conceptually it should make sense. What we're doing is we're going to get the request, um, we're, we're going to perform the request, get our payload, traverse the payload, provide the data into, into the state machine. After all of that, um, if it errors out, we want to provide uh, an, a, a, you know, abort the server request. And then finally, for any actual render function, we're going to return this dot state dot title, right? Because now our state has changed, right? So anytime we are uh, making this request, React will say, "Oh, okay, has this changed? Has this changed?" Right? Based on uh, when and where it performs these requests. And as a result, we're gonna we're gonna get um, much more updated data. Now, I'm gonna warn you right now. This is a very very simplistic example and probably not usable in the real world, just because of the fact that many people recommend using plus to do this. Uh, unidirectional flow of data. Um, so I highly recommend if you, if you do want to delve a lot more deeply into how this would work, um, look at Flux and, and, and look at those sorts of approaches. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this session. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, we're running out of time, so I, so I do want to sort of uh, end with some food for thought and just some sort of larger considerations um, that uh, you might want to consider when decoupling Drupal and using React as your front end. You can use any front end that you want with decoupled Drupal, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, you know, it's a, they're, they're all very, very compelling use cases uh, um, to, to do this approach. So the first is I want to highlight a couple of uh, use, case, uh, uh, use cases in the wild that, uh, that I've seen and that, and that are very compelling. The first is the lowbot.com design, which was uh, very recent. Um, and uh, there was a big article about it on their blog. I highly recommend you read about it. Um, it is a fully decoupled REST application that is built on a Node.js stack against a, a CouchDB database, um, which replicates, uh, which is the REST API that is, that is used in front of you. Uh, and this you know, is good for things like caching and, 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 and things of that nature. In terms of uh, progressive decoupling, um, you know, this idea of Drupal constructing the initial page structure and then uh, allowing a JavaScript application to take over further re-rendering, um, this is a very compelling concept as well. Um, and uh, you can see this in you know, things like, uh, you know, if you use the React module in Drupal, for example, or uh, there's a very interesting POC uh, called Drupal React Blocks, uh, which I encourage you to check out. It's on, it's on GitHub. Uh, might be a bit outdated. And then the other, uh, of course, compelling example of this is weather.com, where they use an Angular front end to take over from the Drupal render that's provided service on. Um, in terms of uh, sort of uh, you know more fully decoupled applications where you still want to provide some awareness of Drupal's render pipeline and, and, and some of this information, um, Drupal can provide this important information about Drupal server side render uh, uh, to a JavaScript application, right? Um, and so, for example, I would highly encourage you to check out the RESTful Panels module. This was just brought to my attention this morning, and it's a really really interesting solution, namely that you export some information about panels. Uh, through JSON to, to, the, to the JavaScript application, which then uses that to construct the page. And so this is a very, very interesting idea because it means that you no longer really, you can have your site builder you know, use panels and, and use the grippy to actually change the column width, but then export that to the client side, and the client side application will use that information intelligently. Um, there's a whole lot of interesting approaches that are, you know, that really are sort of across the spectrum. And, you know, it's a very overarching question, like where, where do we draw the line, right? Um, do we just serve pure data uh, from Drupal? Um, just content, uh, just these content entities. Do we serve some render information like RESTful Panels does in, in that we actually give um, a, some uh, information about how, this, how these things would appear on the server side if it were still in Drupal for the client side? Um, or, uh, you know, do we actually do more progressive decoupling where the client-side framework is very much a part of and inside Drupal? There's a lot of different uh, discussions that we can have uh, with that. One last thing I want to end on uh, is that React is not uh, alone. React is part of a larger ecosystem of open source projects that Facebook has been working on. Um, and so two projects that I do want to highlight in are React and GraphQL. Um, I gave a, a small mini session at the Aquia booth yesterday about GraphQL. Um, but basically, uh, uh, these are two very compelling approaches um, to things like data fetching, um, which, which could be very interesting because, you know, the, one of the, there's, there's the, some weaknesses of, 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 of the way that we build traditional RESTful architectures today. 
Um, and so what I want to do is uh, just highlight GraphQL very quickly. Uh, there's a Drupal member, uh, a Drupal contributor named Fubi, who's working on a GraphQL server uh, for Drupal, uh, which is a very, very nifty and compelling idea. And uh, I you know, encourage you to follow this project because it's going to be a, 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 a really interesting approach to data fetching for, uh, from Drupal itself. Um, and so what I want to do before uh, actually getting to that slide is I want to um, just very quickly uh, show you a quick, um, a very quick video of what GraphQL does as a demonstration of, um, of some of these things that, that we've been talking about. Um, I showed this video yesterday at the mini session, but um, so what's happening here and this is sort of a, you know, a way to abstract away all these considerations. You don't need to use REST as a transport necessarily when you're using GraphQL. It could be SOAP, it could be something else. What we've got here is we've got our custom content type, which is conference, and a couple of custom fields that we're using. And what GraphQL do is to actually uh, uh, submit a uh, is, 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 to, is to make a request that will mirror the response you get back from the server. So what we're doing here, for example, is we're firing a uh, request against the entity, um, against the entity uh, of node ID 3 uh, and getting back only that data. Um, one of the big problems with a lot of REST APIs as they're built today is you either get too much information or too little information. And if you're talking about things like an Apple Watch application versus a single page application, they have different data needs. And oftentimes, we want to talk about unifying these endpoints and making sure that our REST endpoints are, 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 are very efficient. Um, so, What's happening here uh, is that we're actually querying views. This is the traditional admin slash content uh, views in Drupal, and we're only getting those conferences that are uh, in that are that are held in Europe. Um, and uh, what we're going to do even further is to query also uh, fetch also the um, uh, additional custom fields that we have as well. So uh, GraphQL is a very very interesting uh, example, and, and one of the just one of the very exciting things that's happening around the React ecosystem. And um, if you're using React already uh, uh, in a decoupled way with your Drupal site, um, you know, you're actually a leg up in terms of being able to potentially use GraphQL as your, uh, your sort of data fetching, uh, 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 for your data fetching. Um, and so uh, uh, with that in mind, um, I want to end briefly with, um, let's see, just let this go. And there's also aliasing as well, as you can see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so um, let's go ahead and go to the last slide, which is um, there's been a big debate right now in Drupal, uh, which is uh, should Drupal adopt a client side framework um, in order to uh, uh, basically keep a lot of the stuff that we <coughs> like and, and enjoy with Drupal and that is useful for site builders. Um, this has been a topic of several uh, blog posts by Greece lately. Um, and so I want you to think a little bit about how React fits in with Drupal. You know, does it make more sense as a fully decoupled approach? Does it make more sense as potentially something that could lie on top of Drupal as Backbone does right now? Um, it's a very good food for thought. And so uh, with that, thank you very much. And um, I look forward to hearing more. Uh,